scripture says in Isaiah 53, verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray, meaning it's our nature. It's our nature to wander. It's our nature to go astray, just like sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Sheep need to be found because they have that tendency to wander, but they also have a problem. Your dog, you know, runs away from home, and and if it doesn't go too far, it can find its way back home. Your cat runs away from home. It has a reason. It has a plan. Right? It's got an agenda. It's been planning to take over some small country, but eventually it'll come back when it wants to, because it knows how to get home. Your sheep wanders. It's dead, because when a sheep wanders, it gets disoriented and it freezes. It'll just stop where it's at when it realizes it doesn't know where it is, and it won't do anything. Sheep by nature need to be found. But listen, sheep by nature need to be cleansed. They've got a problem. They literally have no way to clean themselves. And they have an issue with their their wool. It's covered in lanolin, which is a really thick, oily substance. That thick, oily substance and all that wool means they bump into things. And as they bump into things, those things cling to it. And so whether it's on the ground or whether it's a bush or whether they roll up against a cliff or anything floating in the air, it's like a magnet. And it attracts all those things and the wool grows over it. Some of those things cut it. It gets infected. Or it's just so filthy they get infections. Or it can actually, underneath the tail, block them from being able to relieve themselves, ultimately resulting in their death. They need to be maintained. They need to be cared for. They need to be cleansed. Sheep need to be led. They must be led because they don't know where to go when it comes to finding a safe place, a green pasture, or finding water. If the water's too cold, they don't want it. If the water's too hot, they don't want it. If the water is moving at all, they don't want it because they're afraid. This is why the scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It goes on to say, he leads me besides the still waters because they need to be led to a place where they're not scared. Sheep need to be fed. How do we know that? Have you ever seen, in all the videos you can look on at YouTube, have you ever seen a sheep hunting anything? Sheep don't hunt anything. I saw one time an eagle on a YouTube video pick up a sheep fly down and pick one up in the sky. Okay, that didn't go too well, but eventually he got what he wanted. But I've never seen a sheep hunt. There's no such thing as a battle sheep. There's no aggressive sheep that goes and attacks other things, saying, I'm not going to wait to be fed. I'm going to kill something. They never do that. They have no way to defend themselves. Sheep need to be protected because they have all sorts of predators. I mean, who hunts sheep? Everything hunts sheep. There's dangers everywhere, and that's what's true about us. We need to be found. We need to be cleansed. We need to be led. We need to be fed. We need to be protected. And praise God, he's able to do that. God is able to do all those things, but he also uses people. This is why sheep need shepherds, people need leaders, and churches need pastors. We need leadership. Notice again, 1 Peter 5.1, the elders who are among you, I exhort I who am a fellow elder. So Paul here is referring to himself as an elder. It's not speaking about age. It's speaking about maturity. In his case, it's speaking about position. So the elders, the mature ones among you, I exhort. Those who should be leading by function, if not position, I exhort. Meaning I have something to say to you to urge you, to help you to be better leaders. To call you into something that's, that's more than what you are right now. To the church, he's saying, here's what a leader looks like. You need to know what you're looking for in a leader and who you should follow and who you shouldn't. And this is important, especially today, because we have a leadership crisis. We have a leadership crisis in every single conceivable area. We need leadership, and we need to understand where to find leadership. And by the way, in every area. And I believe this passage of 1 Peter 5 is speaking about leadership across the board because the things that we learn about leadership in church are things that we can apply in leadership everywhere else, in politics, in the military, in education, in healthcare, in business, in the media, in entertainment, with family, with churches. 
What's true for churches is true for every single group of people in any other context. So where can we find good leaders? Listen, we find good leaders are with the group, verse 1. Good leaders are under the group, verse 2. And good leaders are before the group, verse 3. Again, good leaders are with the group, good leaders are under the group, and good leaders are before the group. Let's take the first. Notice verse 1. It says, the elders who are among you I exhort, meaning this, I am urging you. I'm urging you to do something you've done, perhaps, and need to continue to do no matter what, but I'm also urging you to do something perhaps you have not done. That's what it means. So the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Again, good leaders are with the group. Don't miss this. He says the elders who are among you, I exhort, meaning elders are among other elders. They're among the people. But don't miss this. I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, meaning I've experienced the sufferings of Christ. All Christians experience the sufferings of Christ. It's been granted to you. Who? To you, me, to everyone, to every single Christian. It's been granted to us on behalf of Christ to believe upon him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 1.27. It's been granted to us. So we're in that together. Together we believe, and that's how we're saved. We're not saved by works of righteousness, by cleaning up our act. We're saved by believing upon Jesus Christ, right? So we're saved by believing upon Jesus. We're saved by grace through faith. But after we're saved, here's your other gift, suffering. You get to suffer. And that's something we also share in. So we share in believing upon Jesus, but we also share in the suffering. And so no one gets to heaven without scars. Every one of us gets wounded. It goes on and it says this, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Meaning this, we're all saved the same way, regardless of your your story, whatever it might have been, you're saved the same way. You were a sinner, whatever you were, no matter how big or how little, you were a sinner, every one of us. And every one of us was the worst kind of sinner no matter what you did. Whether you got saved out of prostitution or whether you got saved out of lust, you were saved from sexual sin. Amen? If you were saved out of violence and wrath, or you were saved out of impatience, you're saved out of the same thing, whatever the thing might be. We were saved radically because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We all have that same story. We're together on that. Every one of us a sinner has been saved by grace. We didn't deserve anything and God gave us everything. And the way God is good towards us after we're saved should cause us to have a certain type of fellowship with one another where we're able to say, I was that thing, and now I got saved. And now we're all together saved, meaning we all together were sinners. Now we're all together saved, and now we're all together being sanctified. Every single day, growing up, being changed, going through that same process, some go through that process quicker than others. Some don't learn their lessons very fast. Some have more suffering than others. But we all are still part of the same suffering. And that's something that we share together. Good leaders are with the group. They experience all the things the group experiences. A good leader experiences the same things as the group. Kind of like Marshall Field. Marshall Field was a man who was in the Civil War. He was in the Civil War as a a young kid. The war finishes, and now he's a man. And he goes to New York, and he gets a job in the mailroom. And he works really hard, and he gets promoted. Eventually, he's over the mailroom. He moves departments, and he works hard in those departments, and he gets promoted. And eventually, they ask him to be one of the high-up decision makers. He cashes out, takes some money with him, and goes out west, which back then meant Chicago. And he opens up his own department store, and he becomes a multimillionaire. He had a son, Marshall Field II. That son grew up in privilege, did some traveling because of his health, eventually got sick, and he died. But not before he fathered a son, Marshall Field III. Marshall Field III inherited $125 million dollars. But he did something interesting. He went to college, 
joined the military, served in World War I with distinction. The war ended, he got out, and he went and worked for his grandfather's company in the mailroom. He worked hard, earned the job of being in charge of the mailroom, switched departments, eventually led that department, and the next, and the next, and the next, and literally earned or worked into his inheritance. He had a son. His son was Marshall Field IV. Marshall Field IV went to college, then joined the military, served with distinction in World War II. The war ended. He went home and got a job as his, at his great-grandfather's business in the mailroom. He worked hard, became the supervisor, switched departments, led every department, eventually became the president of the corporation, earning his inheritance before his father died. That's character. That's leadership. Good leaders are with the group. These men passed a heritage down to the next generation saying this, the people that you're going to lead will respect you more if you were one of them. And it causes them to be able to remember as they become the boss, I'm still one of them. This is very true when it comes to church because no one ever outgrows being a sheep. We're all sheep, every single one of us. And so good leaders are good followers, but good leaders are with the group. Listen, they're with the group as members, as a member. Now listen, we don't have membership here, but there's membership in a lot of churches, and I understand why. There's some wisdom in it. There's some positive things about it, but it's never been a part of any church that I've been a part of. I've never been a part of, of, of high church as a Christian. High church tends to have membership, that type of structure. Once in a while, somebody will come and they'll say, I really enjoy the church. I really feel comfortable here. I feel like this is my home. Um, I'd like to become a member. How do I do that? And so I go, you, you want to come? And you want to continue to come? You want to plug in? Mm -hmm. You, you want to be a member? Mm -hmm. Okay. There you are. You're a member. Okay. And just so you know, if you don't want to be a member anymore, just don't come. That's it. That's the nature of what church should be, in my view, because membership really is too formal of a thing for something that's not an organization. We're an organism. Now, if we are, in fact, an organism, though, organisms have members. Not membership, members. And each one of us are members of the body of Christ. What that means is we're invested in the whole thing. The other day, I was walking into the building here, and I think it was Friday, and I, I just, I slept, okay? I was holding my green tea. I was also holding an egg bite from Starbucks. I hadn't eaten anything, been up for a couple hours. I was hungry, and I was thirsty, and I needed to get some work done. But in addition to holding these things, I also had my laptop under my arm. Yes, my famous laptop. The laptop that I have broken the screen on twice in six months, the laptop in which I had broke the power adapter a couple weeks ago, the same laptop. And as I was walking into the church, I don't know how, but I fell and I landed on my knee and my arm as I was trying to make sure, A, not to damage my laptop, B, not to spill my green tea on my laptop, and C, I really wanted that egg bite. And so I tried to hold it all together and I hit my right knee and my right elbow at the same time, and it hurt. I just hit square, boom, and I heard me going like this. And the weird part is, I heard this, as I was getting up, and I realized, that's me. Like, I wasn't even thinking that I was doing it. I just was kind of like complaining, but nobody was there to hear me complaining. And here's why I was complaining. It wasn't just my knee that hurt. It wasn't just my elbow that hurt. When I did it, I jarred my shoulder, and that hurt. And then the rest of my body parts that weren't affected said, uh, we're in on this, okay? We're all impacted by this. And then eventually my mouth on its own was just going, Arr, Arr, Arr. that's what happens. The body of Christ is connected. When one part suffers, all parts suffer. When one part rejoices, all parts rejoice, right? That's what it means to be a member. 
we connect. We connect with one another. We're part of each other's life. So when someone says something like, hey, I got a new job. Oh, praise God. I'm so excited. I'm so blessed that you got a new job. When someone says, hey, we lost our baby, you grieve. You grieve and you enter into that grief understanding, this is my brother, my sister in the Lord. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we grieve with those who grieve. That's a part of being a member. And so a good leader is with the group as a member, experiencing all those things with them, sometimes experiencing some of those things before them because they've matured and they've experienced a lot of those things so they can give encouragement and never say, I know how you're feeling, but you can say, I experienced something like that and God was faithful to me and I know he'll be faithful to you. So good leaders are with the group as members, but listen, good leaders are with the group as mentors, meaning this, the natural progression of body life is for a healthy member to become a mentor. Meaning this, healthy members will be seen by other members and someone else will say to them, would you help me? Sometimes they'll even say and use the words, would you mentor me? It's something that happens naturally. Now listen, how this happens practically is important because no one takes eldership or takes pastoring or takes leadership upon themselves. They can function caring for people. They can function looking out for their needs. But the role, the position has to be given. What that means then is it's weird when a Christian goes up to another Christian. I've seen this happen in different churches. I pastored in three different churches and I've seen it happen where people will go up to other Christians and say, hey, God put it on my heart to be your mentor. To me, that sounds a whole lot like, hey, I just wanted you to know, I'm your hero. That's just weird, okay? Mentorship should be something that happens organically when the person who's a member says to someone else, hey, would you help me with this? Because they see something that you have that they don't yet have. Secondly, it's natural and healthy when the person who's asked is humbled by it and responds, not with this, I've been praying for you to ask me because I see you have many ways you need to grow. No. Okay. To be like somebody going up to someone else saying, hey, would you help me out? I, I know that you're an athlete and I see you're in shape. Can you help me get in better shape? Sure, I see that you, you know, have flabs you should not have. You know, I see, sir, that your chest should not be hanging out in your drawers. You know, so let me help you. No, that's not the idea. It should be something when someone says that, you're humble to say, well, if you see anything good in me, it's Jesus. But if you wanted to spend time together, I'd love to do that. That's healthy mentorship. So a good leader is with the group as a member, but the good leader is with the group also becomes a mentor. Every believer in Jesus Christ should eventually come to a place where they're able to have all three relationships that people have with other people. Meaning one type of relationship is that you enjoy one another. You give to one another and you receive from one another. That's friendship. Another type of relationship that we have is when we receive from another. That's being mentored. But eventually we should grow to a place where we are a mentor, where the person that we meet with receives from us. That's a sign of maturity. And so we need to grow into that. Good leaders are with the group as members and also as mentors. Turn over to John 10. John 10. Notice what it says here in John 10, verse 7. Jesus here is talking about who he is as the good shepherd. So he is the true shepherd, the real shepherd. He is the shepherd. But notice, Jesus said to them again, John 10, verse 7, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find good pasture. What's it saying? What he's saying is, I am the door of the sheep. I'm with the sheep. Here's why. When the sheep are led into a place where they rest, they're led into what would be called a sheepfold. The sheepfold sometimes is built, made with wood or made with stone. It's a permanent structure and it has an opening at the end. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes they're out in the field and they simply find a three-sided cave, if you will, with an opening that's narrow enough for the shepherd to lay in that opening 
whether that opening is something that's a natural structure or something that's made permanently or something that's just put together with bushes. The bottom line is the opening is the door where the shepherd is. So he literally becomes the door. And the only way to get into the sheepfold is for each sheep individually, one by one, to walk over or through the legs of the shepherd. So he touches each one as they come in. Yeah, to comfort them, but also to check them out, to make sure that they don't have something that's poking them, to make sure they're not wounded, to make sure that they're healthy, to make sure there's no need. He's with them. The only way to possibly shepherd sheep is to be with them 24-7 because they cannot function by themselves. This is what a good leader does. So good leaders are with the group as members and also as mentors. Secondly, good leaders are under the group. So they're under the group. Notice verse 2. It says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Don't miss this. Serving as overseers. That's a play on words. Serving as overseers, not by compulsion, so not grudgingly, not with a miserable attitude, like, ah, I hate those stinking sheep, right? Not like that, but willingly. When I first went into ministry, probably a week or two after I went to my first conference, it wasn't a Calvary Chapel conference. It was a conference with a whole group of churches associated with navigators, and so we walked in, and there were some wonderful people there. There were some wonderful teachers. One of them was a man named H.B. London. H.B. London was a fantastic pastor. He is viewed by me as a pastor among pastors. So he cares for pastors. He helps lead pastors. H.B. London was, it was James Dobson's pastor for years. And so H.B. London was up there speaking, and I'm excited to hear, hear about him. He's one of my heroes of faith. And he said, one of the hardest things about, about caring for people is people. Because there are those people that will hurt you. There are people that will cause problems in your life. And he paused. And he said, he said this. Um, they are people who I refer to as joy suckers. Okay? So they literally suck the joy out of your life. Now, when he said that, there was a guy sitting by himself next to me. So I'm with my wife and with my pastor and his wife and with another staff member and their wife. And so all six of us are next to this one guy. We're in the same row, and he's right next to me. And he says, there are people who are joy suckers. This guy goes, amen. <laughs> and he went on, he said, there are those people, joy suckers, that it seems like their aim in life is to make other people's lives as miserable as their life. And he goes, amen. They won't change no matter what you do, and they'll cause havoc in your church. He goes, Amen. He goes, but we need to trust the Lord and know God's in charge. And sometimes they'll repent. Sometimes God will get a hold of their heart. You love them until they do. No response. Okay. And then he goes on and he say, but sometimes they won't. And then they die. He goes, amen. <laughs> and then he stopped for a moment and he smiled and he goes, huh. I'll tell you, some of the most encouraging funerals I ever did. And before you finish the thought, this guy goes, Amen. <laughs> and then H.P. went on to say, it's true. Because for those that won't be led, even unto death, when they die, it's a win for them and everybody else. Because they are finally perfected in heaven. That's what it's all about. Amen? Okay. Everything H.P. said was true and was right, but this guy's attitude was wrong. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm 22, 23 years old. I never want to be like that. I want to have the right attitude. But fast forward, conference, five years ago, I'm sitting there, and the pastor that gets up to speak says, hey, have you ever wished that you could step down for 15 minutes and just beat the crap out of someone? And I found me going, amen. <laughs> Which I happened to be sitting next to another guy to the right this time. He said, Amen. Like, yeah, let's do it now, right? What it says here is for every person in the room, but especially for those who have been hurt. Notice what it says. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Serving. Not by compulsion, so not grudgingly and not complaining. So you never say, oh, the people, the people. 
He never complained. But willingly, that means eagerness, running to it, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So, good leaders are under the group as servants. They serve. I personally believe with all my heart that the only legitimate form of leadership is servant leadership. If you look up leadership, in fact, if you look up servant leadership, if you Google it, it'll say one philosophy of leadership or a leadership style. And then it'll give you examples of a leadership style. It'll say Abraham Lincoln on top. It says Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, and then Jesus. That's garbage. Jesus is one on a list of one. He's what we're aspiring to be like. Amen? A servant leadership. Okay? So servant leadership is a legitimate form of leadership. And that's something that we need to learn how to grow in every single day of our life. Turn your Bibles over to John 10 again. Notice what it says here. John 10, again, as Jesus speaks of shepherding. John 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling who's not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. So a reset there for us. A shepherd is with the sheep. They stay no matter what. That's a shepherd. But the shepherd, the leader, is under the sheep. And here's what it says. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In other words, the good shepherd is Jesus. And he is not just a shepherd. He is a sacrifice. But for those who lead, we are to be servant leaders. And that means we're not sacrifices, but we do sacrifice. No man, no woman could call themselves a leader unless they give. We have to be willing to sacrifice something. And sometimes that means this, freedoms. I like to challenge leaders on that issue. If you're a leader, what are you free to do that you sacrifice doing for the sake of the people you lead? Because every single person who's a leader should sacrifice something. That's the nature of leadership. Good leaders are under the group as servants, but listen, also as shepherds. Knowing this, a shepherd by nature is a servant. But the shepherd by nature is a servant who leads. Being a shepherd wasn't a position of honor. In every culture, every ancient culture, that was the lowest job you could possibly have. Being a shepherd was like being the lemon squasher at hot dog on a stick. That's what it is. Honorable. Hey, I I tip my hat to anybody willing to put that outfit on. I tip my hat to anybody who's willing to do that and smash lemons. But that's an entry-level job. You're not trying to work up to be lemon squasher. The same thing is true when it comes to shepherding. Shepherding is a low, low job. It's a dirty job. It's a despised job. But it's something that we need to have that perspective about that is biblical to be able to embrace it. Understanding this, the word for servant means to serve. Okay? The word for minister in 1 Corinthians 4 is used multiple times in the New Testament. It means to be an under rower. So one that is an under rower. They are literally chained to the bottom deck of the ship. They're chained to it, and they're rowing, and if the ship goes down, they go down with it. That's what a pastor is. That's what an elder is. That's what a leader in a church is. We're under rowers. Paul goes even further and says, we are the off-scouring of the earth. Off-scouring. What's that? After I made those fajitas, I didn't wash the pan. I waited till the morning. And what's it look like? It's that white little grind there that you kind of, peel off. You could scrape it off. It looks like like nasty mashed potatoes, but it's not. It's grease. That's off-scouring. Paul says that's what we are. So a good leader is under the group as a servant, but the good leader is under the group as a shepherd. And what that causes the person to do is to lead. Yes, we lead and we lead strongly, but we lead humbly. We take the burden upon ourselves So the people we lead don't have to have that burden. My dad did that in a lot of different ways. My dad was 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 pretty spontaneous. Yesterday was the five-year anniversary of his death. So I spent a good portion of the day just thinking about uh, memories of him, things he said. 
my brothers and sisters having a group text, talking about all sorts of things, sharing pictures, sharing videos, audio recordings of his voice. And it triggered a memory in me this morning when I woke up because I was thinking he was spontaneous and he wanted to bless us. And I remember one day he and my mom had gone out on a date. They went on dates all the time and they came back and everybody was gone. There's eight kids. Everybody was gone. I was left alone. I was 10 years old. And so they walked in the house. They saw me and my dad said, hey, just get in the car. Let's go. And I said, where are we going? He goes, just get in the car. Trust me. All right, so I thought we were going to just like go out for an hour or two or whatever. We get in the car and we drove to Arizona. We lived in Orange County. We just drove to Arizona. And as we're driving, I'm thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> Dad had a wild idea. Let's just go see your parents. And my mom was all excited about it. So all three of us went. We took off. And as we were driving to Arizona, I thought, I had no control over this trip. I, I didn't even know where we were going. I didn't want to go. I just thought we were going to lunch. That was as high as I was aiming. Now we're going to a different state, right? And so I'm stuck, though. And so I thought, I'll just kind of check it in. Yeah, I'm sure it'll turn out good because it usually will make it fun. There I am sitting in the back seat. I'm 10 years old. I lay down, close my eyes. And I hear him say something like this. He's talking to my mom. My dad could be pretty thoughtful, pretty profound. And he said, he said, check him out, baby. Look at him. He goes, he's not concerned with money. He's not concerned with bills. He's not concerned how we're going to pay for this trip. He even trusts me so much that he'd taken a nap. I thought, well, how do I know that if I trust him that much? <laughs> I wasn't worried about the money. I wasn't worried about the bills. But he was a horrible driver. <laughs> so even though I was 10 years old, I was laying there, yes, my eyes were closed. But I was probably close to praying. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't comfortable. Because I did take that burden on myself, but not the other ones. The other ones weren't my burden. And listen, a good leader is looking to remove the burden from people as much as possible, and they take that burden upon themselves. That's what he tried to do. And that's what any good leader tries to do. Good leaders are under the group as servants and also as shepherds. Lastly, a good leader is before the group, meaning they're in front of the group. They lead from the front. It says this, verse 3, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So again, good leaders are before the group. And that's important. They lead from the front. They're the ones that take the risk. Kind of like Casimir Zeglin. Casimir Zeglin had qualities of a good leader. In 1893, the mayor of Chicago was shot and killed in his home. That murder inspired a local priest, Casimir Zeglin, to invent an early bulletproof vest. After inventing the vest to prove the effectiveness of his invention, he had his assistant repeatedly shoot him in the chest. That's a leader. Why? Notice, to prove the effectiveness of his invention, he had his assistant repeatedly shoot him in the chest. What it doesn't say is he got an assistant to shoot. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that ad in the paper? Searching for a willing person who has no common sense whatsoever <laughs> so I can shoot you every day <laughs> to see if my invention works. No, he simply found a man willing to pull the trigger. He's the one that took the risk, understanding if his invention worked, he could save lives. That's a leader. So a person who is a good leader is with the group, is under the group, but also is before the group. Notice this, John 10, 4, Jesus says this, and when he brings out his sheep, in other words, when he leads them, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. That's what Jesus does. That's what the good shepherd does. That's what any good leader does. We lead from the front, and we lead the people out, taking the risk, being out there first. So good leaders are before the group as executives, meaning Leadership spoken about here is speaking about the whole structure of leadership. There needs to be decisions that are made. But listen, good leaders that go out before the group are examples. I like to term it this way. A good leader is the example, never the exception. So they're not looking to be the exception to the rule. They're the example for every rule. And there's a wonderful example of that we find in history. A man named Isidore Strauss, who happened to be a very wealthy man. He was a former congressman. 
for the state of New York City. He went into business and he made millions. He became one of the wealthiest people in New York City. He was the owner of the May, uh, May Company, or Macy's. And he and his wife, Ida, were on the Titanic when it got hit by an iceberg April 14th, 1912. Listen to this. Though the call came out, women and children first, a very influential friend offered to make him an exception so that he could have a place on a lifeboat with his wife. And this was his response. No. I will not be the exception to the rule. Huh. Refusing to get on the boat, he stood next to one of the lifeboats and helped people to board, at which point his wife also refused to get in the lifeboat, saying, I will not be separated from my husband. As we lived, so we will die together. They were last seen on the deck of the ship, holding each other with smiles on their faces. They died. Their remains were interned in a mausoleum in New York City. On that mausoleum are the words from Song of Solomon 8-7, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. That's beautiful. That's an example. That's a leader. Both that man and that woman were leaders for every single person that day, and they left a heritage for every one of their kids. Understand that good leaders are with the group, under the group, and before the group, means that we have a response. We have a response to trust. The Lord's the one in charge. Notice again, those that are faithful will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Those who are not faithful will not. That's between them and God. But for us in responding to the fact that good leaders are with the group, under the group, and before the group, here's what we do. Three quick things. Be selective. Choose carefully who you call leader. Be selective. Let them earn it. Number two, be submissive. We'll talk about that more next week. Verse five, it means to trust them, to trust them as you trust the Lord and to get in line. Don't make it harder for them than it has to be. And third, listen, become strong enough to lead because I believe every single Christian at some place, some time, in some way needs to be a leader to someone because we're called to lead people to Jesus Christ. We need to be able to lead. I mentioned at the beginning Philip Keller. Let me finish with this. Philip Keller was born in 1920. He died in 1997. He had all those jobs I mentioned, including being a shepherd. He was a solid Christian. He loved the Lord. He loved God's church. He wrote over 50 books to encourage Christians about their walk with the Lord. Listen, but he never held a position of leadership in a local church. He was just able to. He was mature enough to. But it was never about the position for him. It was about the function. He would later write this. Contentment before God is what leads to blessing. And I want my life to be a life filled with contentment. That's what we need. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And then it goes on to say, the Lord has laid on him, that is our good shepherd, the iniquity of us all. So once we experience that and we grow, once we're saved and as we're sanctified, then we mature enough to be able to lead people to that same good shepherd, that one who found us, who cleansed us, who led us, who fed us, and protects us. Amen? Would you stand with me?